All right, thanks, Tristan. Um, well, welcome, everybody. Um, we have uh, a topic that uh, hopefully raises a lot of discussion. Uh, I promise you no death by PowerPoint. There's only about a dozen or so slides on here. Um, and uh, I've left plenty of time in for Q&A, both at the end, but also feel free to interrupt uh, as I go. Um, I think it works better if we get to the questions live as they are in context. Uh, there is zero danger of me running out of time on the slides, so don't feel uh, don't feel any need to hold back on on that account. This uh, this is not intended to run you guys over with content. Um, so the the topic is how do I get started, and this is something that you know we obviously hear a lot at the Linux Foundation. Uh, I use the analogy to Rapunzel's tower. You can kind of see where you want to get, but it's not clear where the door is. Uh, and some of that has to do with uh, the nature of tech in general, the nature of software in general, and some uh, some of it with just the nature of open source. Um, so we'll talk about some of those things um, and what some of the strategies and tactics are to address them. Uh, all right, so let's jump in uh, just a little bit on the agenda. A um, few topics I want to cover. Uh, my name is Clyde Tripasat. I'm the head of the training and certification group at the Linux Foundation. Uh, and our mission ties in very well to the topic today, which is providing training for folks coming into projects. So a lot of entry level skill building, awareness, you know, we do a ton of free courses. Uh, and just trying to ensure that uh, there are ample ways for people to um, discover the entryways into open source. I've been doing education of one sort or another for about a dozen years now. Uh, and open source has definitely been a uh, an interesting change as somebody who came into it from outside. So I uh, I had my newbie hat on when I joined LF a little over six years ago. So I definitely, uh, there's a little bit of personal experience being brought to bear on um, on uh, what it's like to onboard into, into an open source community. Um, so I will talk about some of the resources and the strategies and tactics, but I want to spend the next few minutes just on some context setting. So I think one of the things that you know, is tricky about a session like this is you're, you're never going to be able to cover sort of every eventuality of uh, and every you know tool or tactic that somebody might, might want to use. But it is helpful to kind of step back and think about the context of trying to enter a community. Uh, and so we'll spend some time on that. And then we'll talk through, you know, what are the resources and some do's and don'ts, and then hopefully leave mm -hmm. plenty of time at the end for Q and A. So with that, let us jump in. Um, so there's a series here on thinking about kind of what's unique about. So when you're thinking about jumping into an open source project, uh, what is the context in which you're getting yourself, uh, uh, you, you're trying to enter? I think that's really helpful as you think about um, and make sense of the experience that you have as you come in. And I want to do this in layers instead of and try to create some structure to how to think about it. And so there's a couple of slides, this and the next couple, that kind of progressively drill down into more specifics. So this first one is about, you know, what's unique about the tech industry in general. And this, you know, obviously would you know be more relevant to those of you who maybe are coming at this session from outside of tech and uh, interested in getting more involved. Uh, and so a few points to highlight, this is not meant to be an exhaustive list, but as I was preparing for the session, I thought, okay, what are the most interesting components that might strike folks as different? And I'm going to remind folks to just hop on mute and, uh, and unless you're asking a question. Um, so first off, it's this idea that it's an orchestra, you're not a soloist. And of course, what I mean by that is uh, in tech in particular, uh, there's no such thing and certainly no such thing anymore as kind of a lonely genius, right? Everything you do 
interacts with uh, people, systems, processes. And, uh, and so, you know, I, I tell people that, you know, when I came into LS, I still had this sort of mental image of, uh, you know, sort of the coder in her basement kind of doing her thing, kind of oblivious to the world. And I realized that that might be true while you're writing code, but it's actually not true once you start to put that code out there into the world and, inter and interact with um, all the other sort of systems and processes. And so uh, there's definitely a component of, uh, of interconnectivity uh, in the, on the people side, on the tech side, on the tooling side um, that, uh, I th you know, I think when you're on the outside looking in, maybe isn't as clear. Uh, this next point, uh, to the uh, concept stolen from um, Alice in Wonderland, uh, and this idea of the Red Queen effect is that, uh, you know, the Red Queen is, uh, has a line where she says, you know, it feels like I have to keep running faster to stay in the same place. And it's, what that speaks to is this whole idea of sort of the acceleration in tech. So you obviously don't even have to be in tech to realize that this is happening, right? Just think back to, you know, how recently some of the big tech companies I saw this morning, you know, Slack got sold for $27 billion. It didn't exist six years ago. Uh, things move fast. And, uh, and there will be something that we come back to a few times in the course of this discussion, this idea of, of things move fast and accelerate, because it speaks to what's required of you in terms of mindset to be uh, thinking of, of yourself as on a lifelong journey of skill building. Um, and you, know, you, you will never get to a point where you, where you can say, okay, I know everything I need to know. Now I just need to only focus on execution. There's just always gonna be more new technologies, interesting concepts, and it's important to recognize that. Um, as sort of an exist, you know, a pre-existing condition, if you will. Uh, it's global in nature, right? And, uh, and this is true for a lot of other sectors. It's not unique, and these aren't uh, to, to tech. But uh, I can't think of a single project, uh, or for that matter, a single company that is exclusively operating in one jurisdiction. And so now you're talking about time zone differences, you know native language differences, uh, you know, cultural differences. Uh, and this is back to this idea of the interconnectivity, right? That, that, that you, you, you are entering a, uh, an environment that is uh, complex and uh, fast moving and interactive and collaborative. Um, you know, even uh, when you're de developing code on an open source project, it's a, it is a fundamentally collaborative exercise where you're submitting those requests, having people review them, putting them back in, where you're looking at other people's code, right? And trying to understand how different parts of software work. Uh, and then you're gonna have questions. So it is a collaborative process. And, uh, and this final point is something that has really become more and more um, prominent here in the past couple of years of what people care about and in tech in particular is the results you can deliver more so than what I call pedigree, which is, you know, do you have a degree or not? Where did you go to school? Uh, it, it's actually one of the really great things about tech and software in particular is, you know, if you do great work, it's obvious the people that you've done great work, they can, you know, they can see your work product and that's what they value. But it also means that contrary to, I think, what maybe some sort of popular wisdom is, uh, you know, the, if you've got an aptitude for the sector and you come in, you start finding that, that you enjoy doing code and you enjoy, um, you know, solving these types of problems. Uh, nobody's standing around asking whether you have a degree. Nobody's standing around asking, you know, what sort of apprenticeships you did. Uh, it is really true that, that there is a disproportionate amount of focus on show me what you can do. And I think that's really liberating when you're thinking about entering one of these communities to know that, uh, you know, in that sense, it is very much of a meritocracy. All right, so that's tech sort of super high level. If we drop down kind of one more level to 
what about the software component, right? So you have you know, hardware, networking, software, there's all these different components. Uh, when you hit the software layer, you know, it picks up on the point I was making before of you know, your code is your resume. Uh, you know, the way you build your, your brand, your personal brand, your reputation is by the work you do. When people can see the work you do, especially when you get into the open source, which is the next slide, and the code is available through GitHub or GitLab, uh, one of these public repos. Um, and again, that, that can be really refreshing because you're judged on what your output looks like. Uh, and uh, and that's you know often not true if you're in a traditional type work environment where a lot of the other factors get get, get brought to play. Uh, the you know your code really in some sense speaks for itself, and that can be a really uh, liberating, uh, 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 pleasant experience. Uh, now the flip side of that, and this term search grid is from my old economics days. A search grid is simply one where you can tell ahead of time uh, exactly what it is you're buying. And so there's some different concepts. There's like things called experience goods, which you kind of think you know, but you don't really understand what you got until after you bought it. And there's other goods that you never really know, like lawyer services until after you, even after you experience the service, you're still really not sure how great it was. Uh, code is a search grid, right? The code does what it does. The lines of code are visible. People can can debug it. They can review it. They can comment on how elegantly it does what it's supposed to do. Um, they, but you know, it it is by definition you know a deterministic process when you write code. So when you put code out there, uh, people are able to evaluate it and decide sort of does it do what it was supposed to do. And again, that can be uh, that can be quite uh, a positive thing if you're writing great code because people are able to assess what assess it sort of on its own merits. Um, you know, I, I revisited this idea of dependencies. You know, we talked about collaboration uh, on the prior slide, but there are a ton of software dependencies. And uh, the reason I wanted to re raise it here is that uh, it's not just dependencies when you're thinking about your your code base and how you're kind of working with it. It's also the fact that no software exists in a vacuum. I know in our case, as in Linux Foundation training, we have periodically we have examples where something stops working, and you sort of scratch your head and say, well, "Nothing's different than yesterday, and it worked yesterday. So how could it have stopped?" And more often than not, it's something like, you know, a, a package that got deprecated or removed. Right? It, the reality of software today is it's all interconnected and it's built on top of multiple other packages and you know it's interesting for us at the linux foundation just how true that is because linux itself is now tied into and packaged into so many different uh, computing ecosystems and so i think you know that idea that that you know your piece of code can be great and can be elegant and can still end up uh not getting done what you need to get done because code builds code, 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 code uh, and so it is important to kind of remember that the code does not exist in a vacuum uh, this other point uh, originally i was using this uh, uh, term called yak shaving uh, uh, is exploding scoop so you you uh, this is true particularly in software where you have a clear task and you think, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to try to accomplish, you know, X type of output. And you realize that you well, to get X done, you need to get A done. But before you can do A, you need to have C in place. And before you have C in place, you need to, uh, you know, figure out how to get B into your data tables. And before you know it, you're shaving a yak in Siberia. Uh, you know, it is a classic, and, and it can be frustrating to people when they're new into software. This idea that uh, the scope you thought you had, cl you know, cl clearly articulated early on, just kind of keeps exponentially growing. Uh, but again, because of the dependencies and and just the nature of the collaborations, 
it is often true that you do have these sort of exploding scoops and you need to stay patient with it, right? It's not, it, it's not a sign of a defect in how you're approaching the work. It's simply a sign of the world is complicated. And sometimes things that you assumed are gonna be there aren't there, or you have to build a service, you have to build a connector. Uh, and scope just explodes. It, it's the sort of the nature of reality. And it's something that you have, you're gonna to have to get comfortable with uh, as you work in software. Uh, and then I do want to revisit this point about lifelong learners. Uh, it's really, um, I think this this true. This is probably true in a lot of other industries as well, but it's particularly true in tech, and, and within that, particularly true in software. That your skill set just has to keep evolving. Uh, and you know, new web languages come out, new frameworks came come out, new popular you know um, uh, computing languages get popular. Sometimes they go back and get repopular. So, you know, I remember a time when C++ was sort of a, you know, people thought it was kind of a dinosaur language and now C++ is very much back. Uh, but I think the, the implication if you're thinking about a career in code is uh, that you have to have this mindset of lifelong learning, that there's just, you know, maybe not daily, maybe not weekly, but I can guarantee you quarterly and annually, you're gonna to have to add new you know, weapons to your arsenal in order to stay effective. And, uh, and you need to be uh, mindful that that's just sort of the state of play and you have to be, uh, kind of get yourself mentally ready for this idea that you're on a journey, right? You're just constantly gonna be learning adaptive and having to enjoy that challenge of figuring out how you add more pieces uh, to your skill set in order to ultimately be successful. I'm gonna stop for a minute and just see if anybody has questions because this is a pretty long monologue so far. I'll just say again, don't be afraid to uh, interrupt. Feel free to jump in at, at any time. I'm going to move on and talk about, um, so we talked about tech, we talked about software, and we're just going to come down the funnel uh, to our final destination. And in addition to, right, so uh, what's true of tech is also true of software. What's true of tech and software is also true of open source. But there are some unique components to open source uh, to be mindful of. Uh, the first is just the volunteer nature of it, all right? People get passionate about projects and start um, experimenting with them and eventually start issuing pull requests on them um, for as many reasons as you care to count. Uh, but what's fundamentally true in all of them is that they are doing it out of passion for the project. They're all volunteers. Uh, in that they could be doing other things. And uh, the whole structure, right, the whole review structure and maintainer structure that you see in open source projects where code pull requests get pulled in at the bottom and then you have these peer review processes and you have these maintainers that look at what's coming up the chain. The maintainer will approve something to go in and then it kind of folds its way up the chain. It, you know, it looks very hierarchical and in that sense it looks like a a, what you would call think of in a traditional sort of organizational structure. But the key difference is that these people are being driven by passion. They are volunteers. It is a, a volunteerocracy. Uh, and so when you see a lot of passion, and sometimes that passion can come across as enthusiasm and energy, sometimes that passion can come across as uh, people being brusque. Um, uh, just, rem you know, I think it's useful to remember that, uh, you know, people are in this, they're bringing a lot of passion to the game. Um, and sometimes that comes off uh, as a energizing experience. Sometimes that can be a little bit off-putting, um, but generally speaking, it's not intended to be personal. So good to remember. Um, just go ahead. This is Kristen. Just wanted to let you know you have two questions in the Q&A box. All right, let me have a look here. Oh, sorry, Harry, I'm looking at your question here. I think it was posted a while back. Uh, oh, okay, I'm just going to tell you. Um, Harry, you want to um, maybe um, 
give me a little more context on what you're looking for in the question about galore. Uh, and then the other question is, uh, how to select a project to work on? I'm going to come to that. The short answer is, find the thing that you're really the most passionate about. Um, you know, I think a lot of times people try to think about, uh, you know, which project is going to be the biggest or which one has the most adoption uh, or which one seems the sexiest. And the the real answer is, in my perspective, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll ask Shua to jump in as well, Shua Khan, who is a, a fellow here at the Linux Foundation who's been doing a ton of mentoring. I tell people, go for, find out what you're passionate about and start there. Absolutely, Clyde. That's the right answer because uh, sometimes, um, you know, you, you want to jump into a project where you feel um, like you can contribute or you learn as well. Uh, looping it back to what uh, uh, continuous learning and uh, lifelong learning, you want to pick a project uh, that you're passionate about, want to contribute, and also want to learn about the project. Um, so I would, I would say um, picking the project you're passionate about keeps you in the in the project longer, as opposed to something that uh, you are not interested in. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Um, all right, I want to move on, and uh, I'm sorry, on the chat, Harry, if you could, uh, I'm not sure I fully understand your question about what you were asking me to elaborate on, so I'll keep an eye on the chat here if you want to uh, clarify a little bit. Um, this next point is something that was interesting. It was something that I didn't know and appreciate when I came into open source is this idea that um, your Git handle, right? So uh, I'm, I'm making the assumption here that everybody knows what a Git handle is. Maybe I should back up. So there's uh, most software, certainly most open source, soft, open source software currently gets hosted on, um, on, public repositories, so GitHub, GitLab, there's a couple others. Uh, and the way that you contribute code is, is via a profile. So you have a profile, you have a handle, which is basically your username. And you know, in most cases, you have an avatar. And that's what people know you as, right? So if you go in there with a the handle of, you know, Clyde123, um, that's your Git handle. People are going to talk about Clyde123's requests. And, uh, remember that this is happening mostly at a distance, right? And so people are collaborating in these repos and you may eventually connect with these folks in real life or electronically or at a conference or at a meetup, but there's gonna be a period of time where uh, you mostly know each other and you yourself are mostly gonna be known by that Git handle. Um, and I, I find that is, you know, for folks who are coming in, especially if they're coming in to tech from um, maybe a background where it's not sort of what you would old school think of as traditional with a comp sci degree, uh, it can be quite liberating because, you know, they have, you know, they're seeing a Git handle with no context around where you're from, what your gender is, what your age is, uh, and all they see is your code and what you're pulling in. Um, and uh, that is, uh, you know, a really powerful way to get introduced into the into a new community. And the analogy I give folks is, you know, a lot of orchestras um, in the US and globally had issues with diversity. And many of them have switched to what's called blind auditions. And the only difference from the old edition is they put a screen up. So the musician walks on stage and plays, but they panel evaluating them doesn't actually see them. Uh, so the only experience they have uh, of you is your output. In that case, in the orchestra's case, it's, it's, it's the music that you play. And what they found was that when they started doing those blind auditions, they started getting a more interesting, diverse mix of people accepted in to the seats because a lot of biases that that get applied when you're you know when you're seeing the person don't get that don't get applied when all you see of them is their work, and a similar thing is true in open source right they see your handle they see your work they're evaluating you based on, um, on what you're putting forward. I'm going to hop back to the Q and A for a for a second here. Um, 
So in what sense there are dependencies? Uh, so I don't, yeah, I don't mean dependencies in terms of your participation. The question, I think, I think everybody can see the Q and A panel if you want to play along at home. Uh, it says I meant to ask in what sense there are interdependencies in participation to an open source project. Um, yeah, it's not so much dependencies on you as an individual, uh, Harry. It's the dependencies in the code that um, you know the piece of the code base that's talking to the database or the piece of the code base that's talking to the networking infrastructure. Uh, uh, the, if you've been around tech for at all for the past few years, uh, the heart bleed bug with the OpenSSL security layer is a great example of a dependency that was hiding in plain sight and basically the whole internet built on top of it. And then one day it turns out there was a, uh, a bug. Uh, so there are, you know, it's a dependencies in the sense of the code base. Um, I'm just looking at the chat here. Uh, question about can you give us some pointers on how we can participate on the Linux kernel project and the subsystems you can contribute to? Uh, I think this kind of harks back to the earlier discussion we had that, you know, find the piece that you're most interested in and passionate about. And if you're not sure yet what that might be, uh, you know, go have a look at the different um, you know, sort of uh, components of the software and how, you know, the different kind of maintenance areas and see which one you think is most interesting or, you know, which subsystem um, kind of speaks to you that maybe seems uh, familiar or intriguing. Um, the, you know, I don't know that there is a, uh, a good roadmap on um, sort of how to find, you know, uh, a cheat sheet on finding sort of the best fit for you. I, mean, I think doing a little bit of research on uh, on how the code base is structured. Uh, and I'll make this point in one of the following slides as well, right? That, you know, don't be afraid to start small. Now, just pick one piece of it. Pick, you know, fix a bug. You know, I think one of the things that um, yeah, folks sometimes feel like, you know, you got to make your name early on by sort of putting out sort of a great new feature. Uh, and it's just not the case, you know, if, if, if you've, you know, even fixing a small bug, right? The, the reason the small bug exists is, you know, is that nobody who came before you found it and fixed it. Uh, and so every contribution you make is a unique and valuable um, contribution. Um, so I talked about the Git handle, I talked about this next point, uh, is uh, a phrase I've seen around in some of the literature, and I, it's actually the literature on uh, how, it, basically answering the question, why are people mean on the internet? And uh, in the case of open source, some of those same lessons are true because most of your interaction is happening through a GitHub, through a GitLab, at least early on. Hopefully you start to get, as you get more embedded, and you take advantage of some of the opportunities to get to know people that starts being less and less true. But what this associ associative anonymity just simply means that people are, tend to be meaner to people when they have not met them, and especially if they have no prospect of meeting them. And so it's just yeah, this idea that, uh, 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 yeah, it's not universally true, but there are there are going to be times if you're in open source long enough uh, where this tendency of people to react much more strongly. Um, and sometimes it can be react strongly positively. Sometimes it can be react strongly negatively. Um, but all of you, I'm sure, have been on the internet, right? So this is not a unique phenomenon to open source, uh, but it is true of the broader sense of human dynamics in systems where you don't necessarily have personal relationships or even awareness, right, of the people that you're, um, that you're working alongside. So just be mindful of that. Uh, that's, you know, that's more of a comment on sort of human nature. Uh, I'm just looking at the Q&A. Um, any recommendation on quality control uh, on code contribution from volunteers? Um, all open source projects have inbuilt quality control in that they have, um, review hierarchy, so patch requests get reviewed, they get accepted, they get sent up the chain to a maintainer. Um, and so, you know, the, there's a built-in meritocracy of review. Uh, 
uh, I might pull Shua in again. <laughs> Sorry, Shua, but I know you're on uh, to speak to sort of the Linux piece of this. Um, but you know, code gets submitted as you know. I think I think of it almost like a submission to a publishing house, right? You're you're proposing a piece of code, and then that gets reviewed. Um, and uh, maybe sure, if I ask you to talk about that a little bit and talk about how you can check your own code before you put it in uh, as a pull request. Absolutely. Um, the the Linux kernel development happens on mailing lists. And made, uh, we have uh, several mailing lists for each one of the subsystems. So the uh, so general advice uh, I give people is that if you are uh, new and you want to get started, um, pick a subsystem that you're interested in and then watch those mailing lists and see how the dynamics between people, maintainers and um, developers, contributors, and then everything. And if you do have a patch, you send a patch. Each change is a small change. So you will send up a patch, send to these mailing lists. And we also have a maintainers um, page that lists all of the maintainers. Who do you send the patch to, right? That's the question. Once you have the patch ready, you test it, and who do you send it? So we, the kernel repository has a get maintainers uh, script that will tell you exactly who the patch should be sent to and you send the patch and you address any reviews that come up. Is that kind of answer you're looking for, Clyde, for this particular? Well, I think the question really is about quality control, right? And so there's a quality right. control peer, you know, built into that patch review process, but right. any, any tips for, for individuals as they, before they submit their patch, to, to, to sort of, um, you know, their, their own personal quality control maybe before they submit. Correct. So um, yes, that, that, that is part of testing the patch itself and also making sure that um, the, the, the patch itself passes all the compliance, code compliance. And there's another script, there are several scripts in the kernel that will, uh, can do that for you. In addition to the testing you're doing, obviously, because if you are fixing a bug, you're making sure the bug um, is actually fixed and that you're not introducing any problems. Cool. Uh, Interesting question, just uh, in the Q&A box um, from Pascal. And it is, I have done some contributions on some open source projects and I would like to continue, but I sometimes hesitate to work on an issue because I'm afraid I won't find time to complete it. Any piece of advice on how to tackle the situation? Um, you know, it's a good question, Pascal. The, you know, sometimes life gets in the way, that is true. Um, what, you know, the what I encourage folks to do is remember that you know just because you're working on an issue, it doesn't mean that you've taken sole possession of it, right? Multiple people can choose to work on an issue uh, in parallel, and so if you start working on something in the open source context and you don't finish it, uh, you're not you know the community is not any worse off. Right, the community benefits if you finish the work and submit it. But you know, the fact that you're working on something doesn't mean that somebody else has chosen not to work on it. So I would definitely encourage you to, to uh, if you find something you're interested in, uh, work on it, right? And if you can get it, you know, uh, you know, ideally you get it done you know, within the time frames that you like, sometimes it might take a little bit longer. Sometimes it might be true that before you're done working on it, somebody else comes in with a solution that gets accepted that maybe takes in a different direction. And that'll be an interesting learning experience for you. But uh, because of the distributed nature of the code base, you shouldn't be worried about taking on something and, and not necessarily being able to finish it because the project won't, you know, by definition, these projects don't stop to wait on individuals finishing work. Um, so the, you know, the, 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 the distributed nature of open source in that sense does make it a lot more, uh, creates a lot more windows of opportunity than it would be in a traditional sort of proprietary software mode where that's your module and you really are being expected, counted on to get it, uh, to get it fully developed. Um, oh, that's another question here. What scope is there for contribution by non-programmers? Um, is the pool of projects available for such contributions smaller than for coding contributions? Uh, that's a good question. We've been talking about this uh, in terms um, primarily so far of the you know, programmer 
aspect of it. Uh, and not everybody is a programmer or interested in programming. Uh, in fact, I would say that, you know, from you know, the, uh, if you look at the Linux Foundation training catalog that my team works on, a lot of the training is actually for users. Uh, and so uh, the, uh, you don't have to be a programmer to participate and contribute, right? When you're looking at, you know, when you start deploying a piece of software, you start tying it into other pieces of software, you will start seeing things. You'll start seeing potential bugs that you can report. Um, and so you don't have to be a developer to report a bug. Anybody can report a bug. In fact, that's how a lot of bugs get found. Or you can suggest uh, enhancements that you want to suggest, right? That uh, maybe it's not you, maybe it's somebody on your team or somebody uh, in your circle that you want to suggest an enhancement to, uh, or if you get, want to get plugged into some of the mailing list. Um, you know, identifying bugs, suggesting enhancements, figuring out new and interesting ways to use these projects. Um, so for uh, any of you who followed the container revolution in operating systems and cloud computing, uh, you know, what Docker, which was really the first container company to you know, popularize use of containers, that was built on a foundational concept in the Linux kernel that was there, keep me honest, sure. I, you know, I think you know, the LVMs were there from the beginning and it's just that the Docker team realized, hey, if I take this, I can actually make one machine behave like many machines. So um, I guess the short answer to the question is uh, you don't you don't have to be a code developer to participate. You can you you can find bugs, you can find enhancements, you can find interesting ways to use features that maybe the developers hadn't necessarily thought of at the outset. Yeah, absolutely. There are lots um, of different ways to uh, participate, even including if you want to do testing of these, for example, or look at the documentation and see if the documentation, user documentation makes sense to you. There are man pages, for example, on how to use command man pages. So you're using a command line uh, argument, say in the Linux, and then you go, this particular document doesn't really, um, get, it probably didn't get updated or it hasn't been fixed or there are problems. So lots of different ways to contribute. Yeah, I love that documentation point. <laughs> you know, fixing and finding documentation is hugely valuable because it's one of my pet peeves. It's you know, it is a volunteerocracy, but uh, not a lot of people volunteer to fix the documentation. A um, couple other points here: uh, uh, open source is asynchronous, right? So you submit a pull request. It could be an hour. It could be a day. It could be a week. Um, and that's an interesting sort of state of being while you wait for feedback, right? But it's just the nature of how the pull request process and some of the collaborations work. They're not always um, synchronous. Uh, and then the the last point I want to make on this slide, and I'll talk to see a couple more questions in the chat. Um, you know, I phrase it here is, you know, you get more. You know, there's a lot of dopamine, <laughs> more dopamine for pull requests. And this ties into the fact that you know, we talked about sort of working on stuff that you're passionate about. I think one of the things that I find really interesting about open source is that the, you know, there are extrinsic rewards. Uh, you know, people get you know hired and promoted, and uh, you know the, the career side, formal career side of your, um, uh, you know, of your brain, if you will. But there's also a lot of intrinsic rewards of just seeing your work kind of get, you know, get getting that full pull request, you know, that first, you know, and, uh, you know I can imagine the sticker that you never forget your pull, first pull request accepted. Uh, there's a lot of intrinsic um, uh, rewards that comes from contributing to an open source project, um, whether it's a pull request, whether it's fixing the documentation, whether it's finding an interesting way to, um, to use the project. Um, because you know that you're contributing to a community of folks who are doing this um, coming from a place of um, passion. Uh, I'm going to click to the next slide. I'm going to toggle to the chat here. Um, so Tierman asked, can I use open source projects to learn Java or any other new languages? Should I contribute projects written in software languages where I'm experienced? Um, so definitely, number the second one's true. Like if you know the language, so 
I'll pick an example. You know, uh, Linux is written in C. Uh, Kubernetes is written in Go. Um, you know, I think to the earlier questions about figuring out which ones, you know, which projects you want to con contribute in. Obviously, if you have pre-existing language um, skills, then that's helpful. Um, although you might also want to challenge yourself to learn some new languages, right, and kind of break out of your comfort zone a little bit. Um, so it, 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 it might be an easier spot to start off is to look for a project that, that is based on um, a language that you're familiar with. Um, and it's a great way, you know, and we certainly say this, you know, at Linux Foundation training, that the best way to learn is by doing. Uh, and so if you want to learn, if, you know, if you want to learn uh, a language, whether it's Java, Go, C, whatever, uh, the best way to do that is to give yourself a little project. And a great way to get a little project is to take on something like a feature enhancement or a bug patch and just kind of work your way through kind of a small piece of it. I mean, that's part of the beauty of how open source code gets compiled, right? Is you can grab like a fairly, you know, easily manageable piece and just work on that and then test it, make sure it works with everything else and sort of push it upstream. Uh, so you, you can pick small pieces. It's not like, you know, you've been assigned a whole module of software that you then have to go independently work on. Uh, there's another question in here. Uh, my team at CERN is developing a few projects, very few of which are open source. There's no good reason to not open source these projects. The mildly legit one I've heard so far is that open sourcing projects require more effort because you have to make the project very generic. Any tips on how to encourage open source culture in teams? That's a great question. Um, and it's one that comes up, as you might imagine, very, very often. Um, I think part of it is a little bit about demystifying for folks what it means to open source a project. Um, you do not have to make a project very generic to open source it. In fact, usually what would happen is you can, if, if you've got an interesting project and it may be it's specific initially, but if it's interesting to people because they can see the potential, that's exactly what you get by open sourcing the project because people take that code base and they start contributing to it and saying, hey, you can use this to accomplish X, you can do, you can go in direction Y, you can take this and sort of repurpose it to a whole new sector. Uh, open sourcing, it actually opens the, the floodgates to getting other people to take that code base and build it out in new and interesting areas versus you have to take it and build it out. Uh, now, there are some things that you have to be mindful of um, in terms of the code base, in terms of the license that you're going to pick, and there's some, you know, some education that you might have to do for your team around, uh, you know, the different types of, of open source licenses are available, that are, that are available, and how you go about using them, how do you pick the right one, or the things the ones that you have. So, so uh, there's definitely some of that. There's a fair amount of material uh, that the Next Foundation uh, provides. Uh, I think there's a slide at the end we can look at where that can help you think through that, help you identify what some of the issues might be and uh, think your way through how you um, position that discussion for taking a project and sort of adding it into the open, you know, open sourcing it um, and dispelling some of the myths that are out there. Um, so scroll down here. Uh, will the presentation and slides be available? Oh, that is a good question. I'm going to ask Kristen what, uh, well, I know the presentation will be available because we're recording it. Um, yeah. Kristen, do you make the slide packs available as well? I guess people can just grab the slide view, you know, these are not wood heavy slides. So. Yeah. No, thanks. So, yep. So, as Clyde said, it's going to be recorded and posted on YouTube, and we'll and we'll also distribute the slides separately. So you'll you'll have a copy of those as well. So you'll get a thank you note um, in the next day or so with all of the information. Very good. All right. Um, so we talked about context, right? Of of uh, you know how these you know, at the, the tech sector level, software sector level, the open source sector level. Uh, I want to toggle now to um, what are some of the resources that you can use? And I have this in two different buckets. The first one is about people-based resources, and the next one is about documentation-based resources. Um, local meetup groups. Uh, I have been 
stunned, and pleasantly so, uh, at the extent to which local meetup groups exist for just so many projects. And I, I think it comes back to this idea of the passion that people feel. Uh, there's a pretty good chance that uh, that there's a meetup group within sort of reasonable commuting distance from where you are on just about any of the, certainly any of the larger open source projects. And it's just a great way to start to establish community and connectedness to others in the sphere, especially if you're getting in as somebody newer. Um, and you know they're not super formal for the most part. You know they you know, they often happen at uh, at uh, you know community centers or you know people get together in a bar. Um, now probably have a little bit less meeting up with the pandemic going on right now, but uh, as that fades, uh, definitely a great resource is uh, to get involved in those meetup groups to um, just be able to connect with others that are that are in the space and. Uh, get to know them, get, you know, suggestions like, you know, which subsystems, you know, if you're not already familiar. But it's a great resource. I think it's one that uh, people maybe aren't as aware of because there's no, uh, there aren't great, you know, there aren't analogous um, concepts in a lot of other places or industries, right? This sort of meetup group culture really does appear to be most heavily um, active in open source. So that's at the organic sort of local level. Um, but of course there are just conferences, right? So certainly for all the Linux Foundation projects, we have conferences um, usually multiple times a year, different locations. Uh, and those are a great way to kind of take it up one level, right? Get a lot of broad perspective with, you know, dozens of different speakers talking about their, um, you know, specific topics ton of networking opportunities, what they call the, the hallway track, where you can just meet people informally over coffee breaks, over lunch, uh, just a great place to, you know, it's great learning at the sessions. It's also fantastic networking um, opportunities, especially because of the nature of open source, where a lot of your work is happening at your computer, submitting requests, updating documentation, you know, reviewing things. Uh, it's a great way to complement that um, and sort of scratch your social, social itch, you know, learn about things, um, but also meet people. Uh, and uh, and then I would also just encourage folks to find mentors, right? You know, whether it's through one of the venues we talked about above or just somebody that, you know, you, you, you know, or you went to school with or uh, that you see in the community. Uh, Open source folks in general are just super helpful. And you know, if you can establish a good relationship with, with someone who can be a mentor and somebody that you can turn to for advice and guidance, that is super useful. Um, we have a whole mentorship pro program at LF, which is one of the things that Shua works on. Um, and I know we've had uh, sessions on that that are available, you know, recorded, but you know, finding that uh, small group of you know one or two folks to help mentor you is super valuable. Um, probably everybody knows that you know there's often hackathons on all kinds of things. There's uh, yeah maybe not quite as many hackathons as there are um, meetup groups, local meetup groups, but definitely it's a great experience. It's a great way to just get yourself into the groove of actually working on code and just trying things out, right? Just kind of putting yourself into that situation where it's structured, it's a given number of hours or days. Uh, and it's a great way to kind of get out there and kind of, you know, almost force yourself to start doing some coding. Um, Stack Overflow, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's just a, it's a website, just literally stackoverflow.com. Uh, Unbelievably helpful resource. There are others. I just I, I highlight Stack Overflow just because it's such a broad resource. You know, you can get on there and ask questions about Node or Java or Linux or Kubernetes or you know just answer. You know, just like the whole range of technologies, and it's astonishing how many people contribute and answer, provide great quality answers on that site. Uh, so it is a fantastic um, mechanism for getting feedback on problems, big or small. So if you if you haven't ever done so, go poke around Stack Overflow. 
uh, it is an unbelievably valuable resource when you have questions and it's a way to get input from people that you never would otherwise meet, right? So you kind of put your question out there and then folks will, will, um, will respond sort of blog style. Uh, and then the last one is, um, is wikis, right? So many, maybe not all, certainly the vast majority of open source projects um, have wikis where you can get on and, and oftentimes you can interact with folks and, and you know, submit questions or clarifications and get feedback. And so this is, again, not meant to be an exhaustive list, but it's a good uh, sort of starter path for thinking about how to get yourself plugged in and interacting with the people who are um, sort of further up the learning curve than you are on a particular project. Uh, I'm going to toggle over here and look at a couple of these questions. Um, first one is, I am in an open source project that is in great need of volunteer developers. Any advice on finding the volunteer developers to contribute to code? Uh, list serves, et cetera. Um, list serves are great. If you have good list serves that you can reach out and find, um, uh, kind of make folks aware uh, that that's certainly helpful. Um, just be creative, right? You know, I think, um, again, with the pandemic, these, you know, not as many conferences are happening. I know a lot of people have a lot of success um, giving presentations at conferences or get togethers or webinars like this one. Um, just, you know, finding more opportunities. You know, the one thing I will say about listservs is uh, they're great for reach and they're super easy to use. Um, it might be sometimes a little bit harder to sort of stand out from all the other messages flying around. And so it is a heavier lift to have to put time into doing a presentation or giving a webinar or, you know, visiting a college campus to give a talk. But um, I suspect you'll find that, that, that there's pretty good payoffs from, um, from going, uh, um, pressing some buttons that aren't just, the sort of send out an email uh, and getting engaged in communities that aren't on the list there because that is one of the big challenges right is uh, and, and that's one of the things that you know I know at LF we try to always focus on is how do you get more people into the tent um, because you know, you know mailing lists are great for the people who are already on the inside but really what helps all of us is to get more people into the tent and the way to do that is to find creative ways to reach out to an audience beyond the list of. So it's not all, it's and, you actually want to do both. Um, but, you know, giving talks, giving interviews, um, uh, you know, uh, thinking about what, where are the pools of people that you would like to volunteer? Where are you most likely to find them, right? Are they at conferences in an adjacent space? Are they on college campuses? Are they, you know, just uh, really you know, challenge yourself to think about the people who aren't yet involved in your project. What's the profile? Where are they most likely to be found? Uh, and then in, in trying to find ways to kind of get in front of that audience. Um, there's another question here on how to find a tech mentor. Is it okay to, <laughs> to ask someone randomly to be a mentor advisor? Uh, you can. I think you're probably going to have more luck um, if you can come at it through a introduction. Um, you know, one thing that I've seen people use very effectively is LinkedIn, right? So if you find somebody uh, that, you, that you think you might like to approach, uh, it's the whole six degrees of separation thing, right? I often encourage people to go, go check out LinkedIn to see who you know that knows that person or if there's a chain of a couple of people. Um, you know, folks are much more receptive um, if they get a, if it's a bit of a warm introduction, so I would definitely encourage you to leverage your network. You know, it doesn't have to be somebody you know personally, but if you think of the sort of power of the network effect, the list of people that are one one connection removed from you, so friends of friends, is generally very large, and that and that'll often be a good way to sort of break the ice. Um, and maybe even get some advice from whoever the person that you know in common about who this person is, uh, you know, time availability, interest, et cetera, so that you're not going in cold. Um, 
There's another one here about talking about the mentorship program and how to get in one. Ooh. I'm going to call it sure into, uh, into service here because I know we've got a program at, at BLF and she's familiar with uh, some of the other mentorship programs. Obviously, there's things like Google Summer of Code and Code Some Code. But uh, sure, you mind if I tag you on the, on the how to go about getting a mentor, into a mentorship program? No problem. Yes, I'll be happy to. Um, so we have resources. The la uh, last closing side, uh, slide has a lot of resources. And this is, uh, we have three kinds of mentorship programs, mentorship outreach and uh, programs at uh, LF. Um, this mentorship series is one of them. We are trying to educate people um, with the resources and topics that are of interest to people. And the second one is a formal mentorship program, which is runs three months um, or six months. Um, you can check that out. I will uh, put the link in the chat. Um, I think the last slide, closing slide has the link as well. You can check out we various, various projects. Thanks, Joe. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, let's see here. Other valuable resources, documentation. Uh, there is a ton of documentation. Some of it's in line in the project. So in like Linux, it's like man, info, help. You know, there's all these different commands you can type in sort of in the project itself to get help. So definitely use those. Uh, pretty much everybody has a wiki. Yes, there's readme. Um, sorry, somebody had a question? Okay. One second, I'll be right there. Oops. I think somebody needs to go on, on mute. Um, uh, training courses. So LF has a bunch of free training courses. Again, there's this link in the slide at the end um, on starting with Linux kernel development, a great course that Shua created somehow magically in her spare time. Um, earlier this year, it has like almost 10,000 people in it, in it already. Uh, there's a course on basics of licensing compliance, which I find super useful for folks when they're getting into open source to make sure they understand the concept of how these different licenses work. Um, and of course, LF doesn't have a monopoly on this. There's a ton of other places that you can go to get good, high quality, often free training courses um, on to help you sort of ramp up. And of course, more Google is super useful. It takes a little bit of time sometimes to, you know, sort through the 10 million results that you're going to get. Um, but this is a point I make on a different slide, which is, um, you know, the more you take matters into your own hand to try to figure things out, uh, A, the more likely you are to be able to figure it out and move ahead. But B, if you do need to ask for help, it positions you very well. So, you know, leveraging the documentation, I think to the point somebody asked earlier, um, finding the, you know, Maybe what you do is it helps you find a way to contribute to the documentation if you find a uh, a hole in there. Um, but definitely um, take advantage of the of the material that is already in existence. Uh, all right, I'm going to click on here. Um, this is a little bit of sort of the um, interpersonal side, right? So just reflecting on some of what we've talked about in terms of the nature of how tech and open source software works and the dynamics of um, people volunteering and but not having necessarily always personal relationships. And so no surprise, the first one here is you know, try to build some relationships, right? You know, do it in media groups, go do conferences, reach out to people on LinkedIn, you know, try to create sort of a community, what I would call a community of practice of folks that, um, uh, faith, you know, working on the project or similar projects kind of in the same zone that you are. I think having that network is always super valuable. I mean, this is true, obviously, in personal context as well as professional context, but definitely yeah, takes more effort. I think one of the challenges in open source is you, you, you have to make more of an effort to build some of those relationships because by definition, you're not on the same campus right you're on the same company you're not down the hall right you're going to have to, to do some outreach on your own to try to find those folks if you when you come into a project new for the first time um take a breath let me be an answer and what i mean here is just you know we talked about sort of people are mean on the internet 
it might happen, right? And somebody might be mean to you and you just have to, you know, remember that they're probably not trying to attack you personally. They're probably having a bad day and they're already doing this in their spare time, you know, in the middle of the night. Uh, you know, I think what you'll find in general is that um, the, uh, the you know, folks are coming at this from a place of passion and interest. And uh, sometimes you do need to take a, a breath and let, let things uh, kind of wash over you and to digest them and move on. Uh, the, the distance um, of doing stuff on the internet does make it harder, right? You don't you don't see the expression on the person's um, uh, face when they're giving you the comment, right? You don't hear the tone of their voice. Uh, and uh, it does make it difficult sometimes to uh, to get all the context and maybe jump to sort of the wrong place. So just, you know, I think being, um, being forgiving of, of, of digital communication um, is, a useful place to be. Um, I think this is the point we were making earlier. All roads lead to Rome. Find a place to start, right? Just find a place that's interesting to you. Um, you know, there is no magic sort of single highway that takes you to where you want to be. Uh, you, you, you know, they all lead to the same place. They all lead back into the code base. So just, you know, find a place to start, kind of work at it. Um, you know, I, I tell folks all the time to look for patterns, um, you know, because what I will tell you is, you know, which areas of the code are most dynamic. Uh, it might, you know, if you look at patterns in terms of how code gets used, if you look at patterns in terms of error rates, uh, you know, trying to sort of um, find signal in the noise is a great way to help you focus on areas that that, uh, that might be most impactful. And then finally, uh, you know, my old mentor used to always say, you should ask yourself, is the climb worth the view? Uh, and you know how hard do you want to battle for uh, your particular perspective? How hard do you want to try to you know from, you know how much effort do you want to try to spend sort of cracking a puzzle? Um, you know sometimes you can get into these loops where uh, there's a little bit of sort of head banging against the rock, and so I think keeping that in mind of sort of what's the payoff going to be um, to help guide your level of interest and attention. I'm just looking at the questions. I'm sorry, that's bad uh, idioms on my part. Mark Google is just using Google as a search engine. Um, somebody said, uh, what is Mark Google? I mean, getting Google Maps. Just, I just meant using Google as a resource to find helpful documentation. You can sometimes formulate very specific questions and find interesting uh, you know, blogs, wikis, articles on things that you might have thought were, was a very sort of esoteric type question. All right. Um, I just have two more slides here. The first one is top five don'ts. I have some do's and some don'ts. Uh, and these are just my personal, you know, <laughs> there's others. I'm sure there's a long list of, on both, uh, of things on both um, lists that you could put on. Uh, this first one is something we, and we've talked, touched on this a little bit. In that, you know, there are kind of stupid questions. And what I mean by that is uh, the more you invest in figuring, trying to figure out what the issue is that you're dealing with, the challenge is, you know, doing your research, reaching out to, to your network, uh, the better, if you end up needing to ask for help and ask a question, the more effort you've put into um, defining that well, the more, the higher the likelihood that somebody is going to respond and be helpful. You know, I I give the analogy all the time that, you know, and I've always found that uh, whenever I'm in France, for instance, my French is atrocious. But if I start with my atrocious French, people are super helpful and actually <laughs> toggle to English and uh, and just the fact that I that that I was making the effort, uh, I you get a I get a much better response. I think the same thing is true, particularly in open source. I think open source has, and again, as somebody who kind of came into it new, uh, there's definitely a premium on on sort of respecting and valuing when people try to be 
self-sufficient, right? And so if you see, if you can come to something and say, look, I, 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 you know, I, I've hit an issue, I've tried this, the documentation says that, you know, I went here for help, but I just can't figure it out. You're gonna find people very much more receptive because um, uh, you've demonstrated that, that you have tried to find the answer to the question. Um, this next point is, you know, don't reinvent the wheel. Um, there are a ton of packages out there if you're on the web development type side. Uh, or modules out there in the regular code side, but you know, uh, I, I would encourage you that yeah, when you're, if you're, if you're doing development work, to spend some time looking for code that might already exist to solve some part, maybe even all of the uh, issue that you're facing. Uh, there's just so much great code out there now, and there's no shame in reusing code, right? It's everybody does it. Uh, you know, if it exists, it'll speed your journey. It'll get you to your delivery, to your endpoint. Uh, you know, don't feel the need to have everything be kind of uniquely your own. Uh, don't assume the worst. Uh, we talked about this a little bit. Uh, just you know, sometimes people might be, uh, yeah, you might feel uh, rubbed the wrong way. That uh, doesn't necessarily mean somebody was was trying to attack you personally. It could be true, but don't assume the worst at the outset, right? Try to try to um, kind of push past and uh, understand the context. And you know, if you get to that place where something bad's happening, then you know that's uh, try to make sure that's really what the what the case is, because it is just communication on the internet really can be difficult. Um, beware your comfort zone, and this is back to this idea of sort of. Uh, not just sticking to what you know. Um, you know, push yourself to learn new concepts, new models, uh, new languages. You're going to need to anyway, right? This is the point about the red queen effect we talk, uh, talked about at the outset. Just push yourself to find uh, out of your comfort zone to create those new skills, to create those new insights. Uh, and then my final plug here, just because it can be a um, challenge, is yeah. Uh, Spend some time understanding open source licenses and uh, which ones, you know, which you know, are used in which purpose. There's a great free course that we have on this uh, from the foundation. Um, make sure you understand that context um, of the of the different licensing regimens and what is a permissive license and what is a restrictive license and what does that all mean. It is super useful to have. You don't need to be a lawyer. I think you just need to understand those concepts. Uh, I have a question from Kevin. He says, can we do a demo of how to go about finding a new project? Where on GitHub do you look? Uh, you know, I thought about that. I, I sort of deliberately avoided trying to do that just because there's so many different ways to kind of find projects. Obviously, you can go on GitHub and you can do some basic searching on um, kind of types of projects that are out there. I would actually recommend not starting on GitHub and actually, um, you know, using, you know, maybe some more refined Google searches to try to get a sense for what projects exist, and sometimes that can be as you know, like a just basic query, right? you know, popular open source project on X. Uh, I literally did that um, as a user a couple of weeks ago because I run an, an Ubuntu desktop, and, well, laptop, and um, the uh, project I had been using to do captures of screenshots called Snip got deprecated. And so I literally started Googling for what's the best open source alternative to SNP, and I found uh, what's the one I'm using now, um, KSNP. Um, you know, just you know, you can there's surprisingly good information that you can find on um, different types of projects and and where things which things have traction before you kind of try to go to GitHub and then inspect the code base. It's you know, GitHub sort of and GitLab kind of assume you kind of know what you're looking for. They're not necessarily great um, discovery tools, uh, but the web's a great discovery tool to see what yeah. um, what people are using. All right, and then um, the last slide I had is, you know, what are the top five do's? We just talked about top five don'ts. Um, learn the tools, learn the languages, kind of push yourself out of the comfort zone. 
um, start small, something you're passionate about. Uh, you don't need to, you know, yeah, to use the uh, baseball analogy, you don't need to hit a home run right off the gate, right? Just get, get a small piece, take it on, or take a piece of software and start using it and then sort of build out from there. Um, I tell people all the time, bug fixes are a great way to start. Small patches, you know, you don't have to go, you know, sort of invent this like whiz bang new feature right out the gate. Um, and I will say, you know, this is this point about sort of, you know, behind your GitHub handle, nobody knows who you are. For all they know, you're an accomplished coder on some other project, right? And so I think if you, you know, uh, having the self-confidence, you know, tell you, put your code together, use it, test it, but be confident in what you put out, right? Then people aren't able to sort of see past the handle to, to make any assumptions about the quality of your work. They just see the quality of your work. Use that to your advantage, especially early on. Um, and then the final point is just, it is a team sport, right? Be prepared to collaborate, be prepared to have dialogue, debate, robust debate, disagreement even. Um, you know, these are uh, these are just as much human systems as they are code systems, right? And so, you, you know, just uh, engage in it and, and uh, uh, interact with folks and be, be part of that human side of, of, the, um, of the dynamic. All right, uh, that's my last slide. My next slide is just kind of teeing up Q&A. Um, I do see another question in the chat here and it says, Resources provided are helpful and I will use them. I'm looking for an open source real estate project platform, mainly related to, mainly related to multifamily acquisitions. If you have any additional guidance or knowledge about an effort like this, uh, appreciate it. Uh, I don't, but again, I would, I would encourage you to do a series of just kind of targeted web searches um, that I have found, you know, the two great ways to find this type of project is either, uh, you know, kind of try to narrow the search down on the web, kind of progressively tighter criteria, uh, or tap your network, right, and just kind of go out there and kind of poll your friends on text or WhatsApp or whatever and see who's come across something. You know, once you're in a specialized space like real estate, that's typically going to be the fastest path to, um, to discovery. All right. I don't have any more slides. So if you guys want to jump in, you can type questions in the chat. You can unmute yourself and ask. Um, I guess, I, I, uh, Shua, any other commentary you will add in terms of do's and don'ts for folks? I can w add one thing that never get too attached to the uh, solution you proposed um, in a patch mm. because um, uh, very sure you will have to change it in some sometimes you might even uh, end up with something that's much better and doesn't have any resemblance to what you started with. So I would say don't get too attached to your solution. Um, so that always is a, is a tip that I give everybody. Very cool, thank you. All right. Um... I'm just looking at the q and I'm just trying to also scroll through the, uh, I hadn't had the chat window open. See a comment here about the first struggle point you need to overcome is to, to before you contribute code, is the ability to build and debug the code. Uh, from Uzi, I definitely concur with that, right? Figuring out kind of your you know, pipeline and how to set up. And again, this is, it's not as intimidating as it sounds if you're coming to it cold, right? You know, go, you know, get some of the, you know, do some training courses on it and, and you know, start small, spin up environment, an environment and start sort of practicing. Um, that's definitely worth doing. Just, just letting you know, Clyde, we have about 10 minutes left, just to let you know. Okay. Cool. Thanks. I just I was just trying to scroll through. I too many windows open. I was mainly looking at the Q and A window, and then I realized there was a ton of chat window open as well. Um, 
Saki, while we wait for new questions to come in, I do want to just take a couple of minutes and talk about the last slide here um, on uh, some resources that are available. Uh, we talked about uh, the LF mentoring program, which um, she were heads up. Uh, and I believe these are linked in the document, so you can, uh, when the um, when the deck comes out, um, you can kind of click through. This one goes to Community Bridge, which is our platform for for mentoring. So definitely um, encourage folks who are interested in that sort of program to check out the LF mentoring um, program. Uh, Outreachy, if you haven't heard of Outreachy. Um, they've done a really good job with their remote internships, right? So this year, again, um, you know, the pandemic made it really rough on some other types, you know, uh, Google Summer of Code has always been super popular, but was more oriented towards in-person. Uh, Outreach has got a great um, remote pro um, program uh, that you might want to look into. Uh, the group I head up, the training group, just a ton of free courses. So if you go to just training.linuxfoundation.org, um, and um, like I said, she was course on getting started with kernel development. If you're interested in Linux kernel, definitely recommend the course on um, open source um, licensing compliance basics. You can just go to the site and search for that. That is super helpful. And you'll see there are a bunch of um, additional Courses, especially the free courses, are a great place to start. So you know you can just um, you you make the investment of time, right, to go find them and and do them. But we do try to provide quite a lot of um, con available content. Uh, and then this events team at the Linux Foundation, uh, there's just so many great events that get put on over the course of the year, uh, and it's not just great. Um, presentations, but just great what we call hallway tracks, right? The ability to meet with, expand your network, uh, you know, catch up over coffee, the, you know, ask folks things in person that you might maybe not feel comfortable asking over email. There's just there's a good, great series of um, additional resources that we try to provide to the community that I would encourage folks to take advantage of. All right, um, I know we're getting close to the end here. Um, I want to leave it open for any other questions. I see one in here about especially good free online courses. Definitely the ones I, um, I was discussing on, on um, kernel development, getting started with open source. Um, if you go to training.linuxfoundation.org, I guess I get one of that. Um, and uh, and just look through the free course section. That's certainly useful. Um, we put a lot of our content up on on edX. So edX, edX, edX.org. Uh, it's a, one of the platform sites that was originally for sort of college courses. But uh, the reason I point folks to edX is they're the only one where the vast majority of the content is still available for free. So. There are others, Udacity, Udacity, Coursera, Udemy. Uh, most of their courses have become paid because they're all sort of venture capital backed companies. edX is a nonprofit. And I think because of that, they still do provide truly free access. And uh, we as LF has, have had like over one and a half million, closing in on two million people take off free courses through edX. But uh, edX is also a great place for free content across a whole range of different technologies, not just LF stuff. I definitely would encourage folks to go check that out. Clyde, there seemed to be one question about open source governance in the um, question and answer. Do you want to talk to that? Um, I'm going to try to find it. You, you want to just start on it while I sort of dig it out? Sure. Um, yes. Uh, the question is, can you expand on the governance of open source projects? Ah, right. Um, so I can definitely talk about how governance works within the Linux Foundation for open source projects. Uh, I think it's probably largely similar for projects hosted at places like Eclipse or Apache. Um, there are technical um, 
technical uh, advisory boards that that shape the project's direction that are separate from the the membership side. So LF it, uh, has commercial companies and sometimes non-commercial companies who are members of the organization and who are members of projects, uh, but that's different than the technical advisory boards. And so, you know, we do try to maintain uh, for the projects that are hosted at LF a sort of separate swim lane, if you will, for the sort of technical direction, the, t the tabs we call them, the technical advisory boards, to ensure that we're still having these projects being driven from within the community um, by those who are most passionate um, versus those who can afford to to be part of a project or be sponsors of a project. Uh, and that's really critical, right? You want to try to make sure that you're keeping the door open to, to a variety of different perspectives um, and ensure the health and longevity of the project. So I think from a governance perspective, and this is something that maybe isn't always clear if you're on the outside looking in, the sort of dual track governance of overall project management versus technical project management um, is something that uh, I think we at LF has had, have had a lot of success doing. Uh, there's a question in here about, um, is there a central list of active projects? Uh, there is unfortunately not. There's just so many projects. Certainly if you go on GitHub, there's some astonishing number of new projects being put up every day. Uh, there is a list of projects hosted at the LF, so you can go to linuxfoundation.org. But that's just, you know, I mean, we have a ton of projects. We have over 300 projects hosted with LF, but that is still a rounding error compared to the thousands and thousands of repos that are out there on a GitHub or uh, a GitLab. Okay. Any any closing remarks, Clyde or Shua? You know, I would just say that uh, I, I just reinforced the point I made that on that one slide about all roads lead to room. Just pick a place to start. <laughs> you know, right? find a place that's comfortable. Find a place you're, you're you're passionate about, and you know, it doesn't have to be on you know the world's sexiest topic or the world's sexiest open source project. Get your feet wet. That's the important thing. Get your feet wet, start working on it. Um, you know, don't wait for the perfect project opportunity to come along. Yeah, good advice. Okay, well, there are no more questions. I'd say we can wrap it up. What do you think, Clyde? All right, well, sure thing. Thank you all for attending. Thanks everyone and hope you have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye all. -bye. Bye -bye.